In her influential essay, Poetry is Not a Luxury, Audre Lorde wrote, for women then, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change. Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless. Tonight, we celebrate both poetry and women. We celebrate women who have come before us and made our world a better place. And we celebrate the women who are here with us tonight, including Sana Tears and our distinguished guest, Rena Priest, who is the Washington State Poet Laureate. There are three segments to our evening tonight, and the first will be Rena Priest giving a poetry reading. And then following that, we'll have local poets reading a crown of sonnets, with each sonnet celebrating a historical woman from the Kittitas Valley. Many descendants and friends are here tonight to celebrate with us, and thank you so much for making the trip here. For the third segment, we're going to have nine poets reading more of their original work, and these are the sonneteers and additional readers, Javier Cabazos, John Bedorje, and Joanna Thomas. So, we are thrilled to have Rena Priest here with us tonight. Rena is a member of the Lemmy Nation. She is the Washington State Poet Laureate and a Maxine Cushing Gray Distinguished Writing Fellow. She is also the recipient of an Allied Arts Professional Foundation Poets Award and fellowships from the Academy of American Poets and Indigenous Nations Poets. Her debut collection, Patriarchy Blues, received an American Book Award. Her second collection, Sublime Subliminal, was published as a finalist for the Floating Bridge Press Chapbook Award. And her most recent book, Northwest Know How Beaches, includes poems, retellings of legends, and fun descriptions of the most beloved beaches in Washington and Oregon. She holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. Please help me welcome Rena Priest. So happy to be here with you all this evening. And what a what a beautiful event in such a gorgeous space. It's just wonderful. So many faces. Wow. Holy cow. Ellensburg is jumping. <laughs> uh, so I guess I'll start off with a poem from my first book. Um, since we're doing like you know Women's History Month and all of that, we'll start off with Patriarchy Blues. This was the title poem of uh, the book, and then I changed it. I like over edited it, you know, and then, <laughs> um, and then I, it never got put back, but maybe someday. So here you go Patriarchy Blues. At the nail salon, colors shimmering throws along the walls, a conundrum conjuring variety, glistening like an impossible city. Choice is always a factor in. The more choices we're given, the greater our capacity for dissatisfaction. It's okay, there's always red. But then there they stand, a selection, sorted aside, sorted in their suggestion. Snake's tongue, Granny used to call painted nails. Poesis, I say, the name to make the shade. Fishnet stockings red, Freaky Friday nights red, Gypsy girl red, vodka and caviar red, Drive church ladies insane with envy red, Cat fight red, Will somebody please pay attention to me? Red. <laughs> All this and still I can't find a shade to fit the statement that I want to make. This predatory capitalist patriarchy is killing me and I'm trying to learn to like it. Why have I never seen that shade in here before? <laughs> Probably the labels are too small, so they call it ladies, sing the blues, and forget it. <laughs> so I'm really excited. I'm going to share a 
little bit about the anthology that I um, just collected. This is it. It is here. Well, it will be here in April. This is like the only one. Um, but and, and if you are making it to AWP, which is the Association of Writers and Writing Programs um, conference in Seattle in next week, there, there will be copies for sale there. Otherwise, you know, we're going to have to wait for it to hit the shelves until April. Um, but I'm going to read you the first poem. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to read you the epigraph, which is by Billy Frank Jr., who was a, um, he was an ally of the salmon. He was, he's a Nisqually tribal leader and fought tirelessly for the salmon. I met him once. He had been to jail 51 times. <laughs> for fighting for the rest of the So an amazing person. Um, and he, he used his words for the epigraph with permission from his family. He says, I don't believe in magic. Oh, also I should tell you, this is a collection of salmon, salmon poems exclusively by Washington State poets, in case you didn't know about it. Um, it was part of my project, my term as Poet Laureate. So here are Billy Frank Jr.'s words. I don't believe in magic. I believe in the sun and the stars, the water, the tides, the floods, the owls, the hawks flying, the river running, the wind talking. They're measurements. They tell us how healthy things are, how healthy we are, because we and they are the same. That's what I believe in. Those who learn to listen to the world that sustains them can hear the message brought forth by Salmon. And just to give you a little sneak peek at what might be in here, I'll read you the very first poem, which is by a Bellingham poet named Rob Lewis. It's called, I Went Looking for the Wild One. I went looking for the wild one, the howler, the Vedic tramp, the one for whom the wounded hillsides are inner burns, whose blood is stained with the old love wine of poet and earth. Warrior poet, slinging battle flack out at the static, shattering polite conversations everywhere. I looked in the anthologies, listening for echoes, traced for signs in the quarterlies, magazines, best ofs. I learned it's been a good year for poetry. Grants and awards coming in, contests and prizes proliferating. The wise gray consensus counsels a return to the classics. Meanwhile, poor salmon scientist holds extinction in a palm full of numbers with nothing but data to howl with. You know, the salmon scientists, I, I went to a conference once and I was asked to read for them and they are a tough room. <laughs> you know how like you guys are laughing and emoting and applauding and stuff? This is like, this is the poetry crowd that I'm used to. And I went there and I read to them and it was crickets. And I was like, what are you guys? I don't know. Um, I actually told them that they were they were a tough crowd, and they came up. A couple of them came up to me after, and they were like, "We really like it. We just have to think about it." Something. So this poem uh, is in the newest Madrona project, which celebrates public art, and I'm sharing it because you know we're surrounded by all this beautiful art, and it's about. Um, <coughs> Uh, public, it's like a, a piece of land art in Bellingham and it's called Stone Enclosure Rock Rings and it's at Western Washington University and if you're ever there, go visit. It's like lined up with the North Star and it's just beautiful. It's by Nancy Holt and so this is celebrating her beautiful sculpture. And it's called Round Dance. I've heard that a triangle is the strongest shape. Okay, perhaps. But a circle will always circle back. For its reliable tenacity, nature loves a circle. A circle is relentless. We've been going in circles on this rock for eons, a fractal making songs as generations spin along, spinning out new variations with each turn in the cycle. 
New tyrants, new saviors, new hungers, new flavors, new yet patently familiar. A drum is a circle, a community is a circle, a yurt, a turret, an igloo, a powwow, a pan tomb, the hero's journey, a day, a year, the tides, the moon. An iris, a pupil, a nipple, a breast, one circle, a ripple out into the next. An ovum, a cell, splitting like an atom, exploding, growing, arms, legs, joys, griefs, ascending and circling back, 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 all the way back to the tomb. Dust and ash, you'll be back. Energy cannot be destroyed, only transformed. Is it a comfort or a horror? It's both, it's everything, and it would be overwhelming. But here we are again, where we retract to void, relax. Let the song hold you wrapped. Nature loves a circle. It's on the Empty Bowl Press website, and they are also the press that put out the Salmon Anthology. So that's also where you can get that. It's just Empty Bowl. I think it's just EmptyBowl.com. And you can order your copy of the Madrona Project with all of the great public art poems. Um, or you can order this or whatever other selection they have available on their site. It's a great press. Um, so this poem actually is a very, very recent poem that I wrote for another um, exhibit that was in the gallery, the Museum of Northwest Art, which is in McConnor, Washington. And um, they had an exhibit acknowledging and just to raise awareness of the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And this is something that um, has been, you know, I've been deeply impacted in, by in my life, and so I was invited to write a poem and read it um, as part of that event. And so this is the poem that I wrote. And it's called Nations Made of Homes, with an epigraph from the BIA.gov website. It says, for decades, Native American and Alaska Native communities have struggled with high rates of assault, abduction, and murder of women. They must have heard that old proverb a nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground. Is this why they kill our women? Forty years ago, my stepsister's mother went missing, was murdered, her body found in a riverbed. The house I grew up in was filled with her absence. My mother tried to make that home happy and bright, to restore its grand and beautiful life but the walls were coated with grief, like flaking grim lead paint. Grief poured from the taps like mercury. Grief hung heavy in our chests like black mold spores. At first, I was too young to know what all that grieving was for, but I felt it. My stepsister cried in the dark of our shared room. My stepfather was restless and glum. My mother wept and moaned that she lived in the shade of a ghost. For me, it went on for almost a decade until I grew up and moved away, out into the fresh air and sunshine. But that feeling clung to me, the sense that something was missing had been taken away that at any moment the world could be torn and never mend. My mother eventually abandoned hope of ever making that house her home. Now she lives alone, complains of ghosts. My stepsister finally laid down in the river of her grief and went to the other side to find her mother. And that house, that once grand and beautiful home is boarded up on all sides, the windows, closed eyes, of the conquered. So I'll try to end on a more upbeat note, uh, but I felt like it's important to, um, to acknowledge 
And so uh, this poem, I was invited to uh, submit a, like a poem that would be possibly made into a baby board book. Um, they asked if I wanted to write for children, and I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Have you read my work? Um, <laughs> But, um, but I tried it, and this is what I came up with. And it's a little dark, because I read Lorca's essay, and he, he says, you know, the lullabies are like the darkest. Oh, and it was supposed to be a lullaby. So Lorca, he like gives example of like really horrifying lullabies from around the world, including Rockabye Baby, which, you know, you don't know if that baby's okay to me or not. Um, and so I, I had that in the back of my mind when I'm writing this lullaby. Um, but. Uh, we'll see what happens with this project. <laughs> right now it's a poem and I'll share it. It's called Dream Passage. On the path we walk toward purpose, if we feel we've lost our way, if our confidence deserts us and we fear we've gone astray, when the road stretched out before us is a challenging terrain, this is when we search our heart for a passage back to grace. Our dreams have wisdom to impart if we are true and brave. And though the night is dark, there is always a new day. When every door we try is locked and the view out every window is of that lonely road we walk, full of worry, want, and woe. When the stream of life within is blocked by living in our sorrow, this is when we search our heart for a passage to tomorrow. Our dreams have wisdom to impart if we are true to what we feel. Yes, indeed, the night is dark, but our dreams have answers to reveal. Thank you all so much for letting me be a part of this beautiful evening.